I'm going to go straight in, Julia Fenton of Unilever. I do want to say a quick shout out. Unilever is the first major company to embrace the notion that there could be legislation uh, to end animal testing on cosmetics. And I want to say thank you very much. So thank you, um, thank you, Andrew. Um, thank you, Thomas and the CAT team uh, for the invitation um, to speak to you. It's a real pri privilege to be here. Um, Andrew, of course, claimed the record at uh, 43 years. So um, I think uh, maybe I make uh, 28. Um, but I'd just like to acknowledge, I think, uh, listening to Michael again, uh, for the first time in a long while, um, I was reminded of the major impact that he's actually had uh, on my thinking um, and the areas of focus since the, uh, since the 1990s. Um, it's been a fantastic experience working with him um, at Frame and then at, at ECFAM. Um, but obviously then for most of my time, probably for the three quarters of my working life in this area, um, I've been in industry and so I'm going to focus today uh, very much on what we've been doing in, um, in Unilever. Um, but first, maybe just to acknowledge that um, uh, the shaping of my working life was very much the thinking of Russell and Birch around predictive modelling. Um, and I've seen a couple of people put on their slides the high fidelity fallacy uh, of biological models. Um, and I think that was where I was questioning as a master's student studying toxicology, um, you know, why wouldn't we think differently around doing standard toxicity tests, um, the high doses, um, et cetera. Um, so, you know, that was really what um, inspired me um, to progress my career in the alternatives area, uh, to think about how we could pioneer new approaches based on really leading edge um, scientific thinking um, and develop novel tools that then could be applied um, for human relevant um, evidence-based decision making. So I'm just going to structure today's um, session around sort of some personal reflections and I've pulled out five um, here. Um, I did have the opportunity last month to speak at the EPAA um, annual conference uh, and I participated in a very interesting panel discussion and Horst and Erin uh, were there as well. Um, and I was sort of looking to stimulate um, some change in thinking in the EU policymakers, uh, particularly around the current chemicals testing requirements, and I'll come back to this later. Um, but I think for today, in terms of what I think the, the five main lessons that I've learned over the past 25 years or so, um, the first one being um, that policy and legislation have actually stimulated change and scientific progress. Um, even if as a scientist I objected uh, to putting in place animal testing bans, I do think that that uh, stimulus has helped in terms of the investment and the progress uh, that we've made in the, in the research. Working together across all stakeholders has been key. I think that's when we have been at our best, um, when academic, government, industry and NGO scientists and poly policymakers have come together and collaborated on common challenges, um, each of us playing our respective roles to make progress. The third point there around progress would be faster if we hadn't been constrained by some traditional um, beliefs and assumptions. I think um, that traditional thinking has limited our progress, um, and maybe I'll come back to that later. Um, the fourth point is around the value of case studies when we're thinking about how we demonstrate um, the application of some of the new methodologies, be it called next generation risk assessment or new approach methodologies, NAMS. Um, when we're taking those into safety decisions and we're trying to build confidence in those decisions, then it's the case studies that are helping us to translate theory into that applied decision making. And then the fifth point is more one for the future. Um, which is there's um, uh, an excellent um, government initiative um, accelerating the pace of chemicals risk assessment um, and the thinking there around how we use the novel approach methodologies for regulatory chemicals testing. Um, and I think there, uh, that is one of our biggest challenges as we, as we go forward um, and how do we actually um, tap into the good work that's being done um, by the, the government groups there. So the first point to policy and legislation stimulating change and progress. Um, you know, a positive outcome uh, of the lengthy negotiations around stopping animal testing of cosmetics 
in the EU was that it really focused investment in alternatives research. And more importantly, it actually stimulated some of us to think a bit differently. In fact, probably radically rethink how we might actually assess product safety quite differently using the new scientific tools that were becoming available to us. In particular, I think the advent of computational modeling and informatics approaches, uh, the building of systems biology capability, and then the involvement of mathematical modelers, physicists, engineers, alongside <coughs> biologists and chemists, that actually started to drive a real step change in mindset and actually transform how we've been doing some of our safety uh, assessment approaches. And we've particularly done that in, in Unilever with a very, very different scientific team to what we would have had um, you know, 15, 20 years ago. That journey for us started in 2004. We're 15 years in and we still have a long way to go. Um, but we have made con considerable progress, I think, um, uh, in that time. But then I think what really has stimulated a lot more of the thinking is actually what's been referred to previously, which is that publication in 2007 of toxicity testing in the 21st century, the vision and the strategy. It was a pivotal event, and I think for me, it really signaled a change in leadership um, and approach. Um, I doubt it's just me who's quite quick to acknowledge and credit um, the impact that US government scientists have let, had in actually shaping um, the three R's approaches for chemical safety assessment over the past decade. Um, reports and frameworks like this are a good starting point, but actually the impact comes from the follow-up investment that's been shown in actually developing and delivering upon the roadmaps um, that have provided the new tools and approaches. And I think the EPA teams have certainly done that, um, and the NICETAM's work as well is widely acknowledged by the global scientific 3Rs community. Um, so it's, it's nice to be in the US and be able to be talking um, the, uh, the real new exciting stuff, which really does harness uh, some of the um, exciting new science and technology. I think the, um, the new paradigm um, that we started thinking about and trying to shape probably back in 2004 has been built upon considerably um, over the past 15 years. It's gone through many iterations, um, lots of broad scientific input. Um, EU research programs such as SORAT and EU Tox Risk have actually helped to start to shape and refine this. And what we've got now is something that is, is really a sort of a, a next generation risk assessment toolbox. Um, we do use this um, in Unilever for our consumer product safety assessments. Um, but it's still at that point where it's needing to be properly evaluated. And there's lots of different activities at the moment focusing around using um, the framework and trying it out with case study chemicals with multiple partners and a range of chemicals. And I'll come back to case studies later, but this is what really takes something that's good on paper, good in theory, and actually starts to test it out in terms of decision making um, where we're actually thinking about making sure we adequately protect consumers uh, and provide an adequate level of, of, of safety. Continuing on the sort of the working together um, across all stakeholders being key to making progress, I've just pulled out um, three examples here uh, just to illustrate where, you know, I feel personally we've got strong progress being made. Um, obviously through the research space, um, the EU tox risk uh, program is, is actually being successful in delivering um, some tangible tools, but also that understanding of how to apply them in practice. And you've got leading academics working alongside the government and industry scientists there. In the regulatory application area, if I look at it from a cosmetics point of view, then it's actually the ICCR um, initiative that has driven a step change. A step change in how um, the regulators in that space <coughs> in various key markets actually understand and think about the adoption of non-animal approaches. And then there's multi-partner initiatives that are being catalyzed by non-profit organizations and, and NGOs, such as the HSI example here, um, where under the new Animal Free Safety Assessment Collaboration, we're looking to try to build non-animal safety science capability and decision-making um, approaches across industry uh, and the regulatory scientists globally. Um, and that you know, takes it out then of the fact that we've had to invest in the EU, we've got 
expertise in the US, but actually, if you look at the industry, we need that globally. We need that in the LATAM markets. We need that in the Asian markets, for example. And case studies become an integral part of all of these important multi-stakeholder programs. That's what really brings it alive to the practitioner who's working in the lab or back at base in the, in the office. So just um, on the ICCR activities, I think here um, we've driven a, a sort of a, a step change in the acceptance of the new approach methodologies, the NAMs, um, particularly because we've managed to get the exposure-led assessment um, approach uh, firmly embedded. So how do you take robust exposure data and the deep knowledge of how consumers use different products? That really then opens up the possibilities for how you conduct a non-animal consumer safety assessment, even with novel ingredients, because you're actually first starting with understanding well, how much the consumer is going to be exposed to, whether that's just going to be dermal exposure or whether that's actually going to um, be some sort of systemic exposure. And the Unilever team, um, the work here led by Paul Carmichael and Matt Dent, we have been presenting our next-gen risk assessment approach and examples which are fully aligned with those ICCR principles and the EU tox risk workflows at key meetings. Um, so trying to bring alive the application piece into the ICCR uh, discussions and for half a day with the Scientific Committee on Cosmetic Safety in the EU, which Paul Carmichael will tell everyone was quite challenging. Three hours of next-gen risk assessment uh, with, with that particular group of individuals. Uh, he felt he'd really sort of earned his, uh, his salary by the end of the day. Um, but it, it's those types of engagements that will facilitate the broader understanding and adoption by key influencers, as well as um, by the safety scientists themselves. So... Um, I think open and transparent engagement and dialogue is probably key for building confidence and, and key for building trust um, between the different stakeholders. The new next-gen um, non-animal product safety assessments are still very much run as investigative projects. So they're rooted in scientific experimentation, uh, but they've got a clear focus on the safety decision that's needed and also the key consumer safety risks that we're trying to address. So they're tiered approaches, uh, they're iterative, they start with the simple tools, so starting at the left-hand side with the tier zero, uh, existing information, but then they progress into um, using sort of a new suite of assays which combine things like transcriptomics data, uh, data from receptor screens, cell stress panels, and then interpreting those data in the context of consumer exposures by applying um, kinetic modeling approaches. There's also then more complex tier two models that are deployed if, if, if needed. But ultimately, you're talking about much more of an investigative research activity to try to get to uh, an adequate sort of safety assessment for these materials using these approaches at the moment. And then, of course, how do we address the uncertainty in the decision making? Well, that fortunately is decreased if we get clearer mechanistic understanding uh, from these models and tools as we go through. Um, so that's the type of approach that um, is being applied. And then finally, just when I'm talking about working together, I just want to recognize the progress that's been made in China over the past eight years or so, with the input of many people in this, uh, in this room in terms of how we've brought together the scientific and, and regulatory thought leaders. So Unilever's investment here has been quite considerable, but it did all start with the TT21C strategy and vision because it was Mel Anderson and some of the leaders on that report who were prepared to come out to China in 2011 and actually have some discussions with the scientists and the regulators um, just using Unilever's Shanghai facility as uh, an appropriate sort of base for doing that. And that really has stimulated a lot of scientific work in China. I mean, there's much, much more to be done, but at least um, we know that they are interested and, and, and progressing to build the capability and we are having success in, in influencing the regulatory change. And I credit Erin quite a lot for uh, the work that's now going on in that space. Third one, it's a short one, but it's potentially very critical for us for future progress and outcomes. You know, I had a very traditional toxicology training. It did make me question the use of safety factors applied to animal data. Uh, but if you think about it, the training now of the people who join the companies, they're coming through very different um, scientific backgrounds. 
Um, yes, they have uh, toxicology and life sciences backgrounds, but it's very different training, and they do actually tend to be strong advocates uh, against animal testing. Um, they have very different beliefs and assumptions and less constrained, I think, by wanting to belong to the animal um, toxicology uh, traditional uh, community. So it's their fresh ideas and creativity where they're applying new science, new technology. Uh, that's what convinces me um, that uh, we will be successful as we go forward. We shouldn't be feeling constrained and I think there will be much faster progress made over the next 10 or 20 years than maybe we've made in the last 10 or 20. Just turning quickly to the fourth learning and I'll come back to the importance of case studies uh, and showing how we make safety decisions with these new approach methodologies. So sometimes we're needing to use hypothetical examples. So the left hand side there where we've um, used Coumarin as an example, um, that's one where we've essentially been uh, using this as an internal training exercise um, in terms of what would happen if we put various concentrations of Coumarin into different types of products and how would we work through the safety assessment. But then we decided that the teams had done quite a good job, so we'd start to talk about it a bit, and then we've subsequently then started to discuss what we've done as a case study um, with the SCCS and within the ICCR community so that you can start to see how you would apply uh, the new tools and approaches for decision making. Then for novel ingredients, essentially every time we start that, um, it's, it's starting with the project teams, starting it as a, very much as a, a, a research project, um, collaborating with uh, internal teams, strategic suppliers and other partners. And then if we turn to the right hand side, we have products in market which do include novel ingredients now, where that safety risk assessment has been based solely on non-animal approaches, quite often bespoke assays have been developed as part and parcel of the overall research program. This one shows an example where we've got a, a novel biosurfactant in a hand dishwash uh, product in Chile. Um, and obviously here, a key driver uh, for innovation is to start to replace petrochemical derived ingredients with those from renewable bio-based sources. And what we really don't want to be having to do is to repeat all of the animal studies that have underpinned the petrochemical version when we're moving to a bio-based um, route of production. This is the framework that we used in the Coumarin case study. And the reason for showing it is just really to say that we now intend to evaluate this framework with more chemicals. And we want to try to do that in a very open and fully transparent way. So welcoming input, critique and challenge from external experts as we design and develop um, the study uh, protocols uh, that we use. Um, we'll need to rethink, I think, in the future how we start to validate the new approach methodologies. Um, integrated weight of evidence, safety decision making is quite difficult to compare with what we've done in the validation in the past where we've used single assays potentially to replace animal studies. So as we start to rethink how we're going to uh, assess, evaluate, um, validate uh, the new approaches, then starting here with, with things like this and learning as we go and trying to do that in a very open and transparent, transparent and public way is, is, is how we've decided to proceed. Um, so hopefully we'll take some learnings in terms of what we do here that can feed into how we might need to rethink and reshape uh, the validation of NAMs within a safety decision framework going forwards. And finally, my fifth point is around our ongoing <laughs> challenge in the chemicals area. So how would Unilever, as an end user of chemicals, um, avoid the mandatory animal testing of new ingredients which is required at the moment by the chemicals um, regulations um, and how can we work with suppliers um, who have to register those materials and for example in the U EU have to go through a checklist of animal studies uh, to do so um, and what you know the, the slide here illustrates is there's a really exciting activity going on across the government authorities, APCRA, accelerating the pace of chemicals risk assessment, uh, really promises to be uh, an important initiative here in terms of unlocking that more mandatory um, checklist hazard-based uh, animal testing. Um, and I think here, 
how to extend sort of engagement to non-government scientists beyond the regulatory community is, is one of the things we need to be thinking about. And certainly I've seen the EPA having hosted the, uh, the last meeting uh, are considering how best to do that. And the other bit is how do you take something that's happened in the US and try to leverage it back for progress in the EU. So as an EU citizen, for us, it's great to see commitments being put in place in the US that we can then essentially go have com conversations back with the EU politicians and say, OK, what is going to be the EU's response in terms of how we then look at eliminating um, animal testing in the, chem in the chemical safety space? So when I was in Brussels a few weeks ago, my call to action really was to how to say, how do we quickly translate the learnings that have taken a long time to develop in the cosmetics area and translate those into other sectors and, and particularly into the, uh, into the chemical sector, um, where, you know, historically we had struggled to make um, progress quickly in the cosmetic space, but then the combination of EU policy changes um, the regulators engaging through ICCR, and then the global NGOs um, coordinating some of those activities and bringing all stakeholders together. That really was the unlock when it came then to um, actually making um, good progress and, and implementing the methods effectively in the cosmetic space. How can we think that through when it comes to the chemicals assessment and chemicals uh, registration area? Um, and what of saying really was, you know, we need stronger commitments by the EU policymakers and the regulators that will actually sort of uh, provide the stimulus uh, for us to be able to galvanise everybody again around that chemicals um, area. So just to finally recap, um, those were my five top five personal lessons learned. Um, I think I will always focus on the working together piece. Um, that's the thing I think that historically has meant that we have made good progress, um, that we continue to actively and openly work together across all interested groups, regulatory, academic, industry, and nonprofit, um, to pioneer change and to build confidence in 3R's approaches. That's my biggest desire, but also that we do so um, to improve our science-based decision-making so that we better protect um, people and our planet. And my inspiration has come from two real pioneers, they were pioneers, they were thought leaders, um, and I'm sure, you know, in many different ways they've inspired each of us in the room. Um, we need to sometimes take things a little bit at, at face value. Um, there's some great stuff in the principles of humane experimental technique, but it does go on a bit. I do agree, Michael, yeah? Um, but hopefully the thing there is that we're passing on what we've learned. We're passing on the passion, the commitment, the enthusiasm to the next generation of scientists. Um, who I fully expect will make faster progress in implementing 3R's approaches than maybe we've managed in the past 60 years. And I was then asked lastly um, to remind people to put a date in their diary. Um, I worked with Bert and the team when we did the 1996 World Congress in Utrecht. We are back in the Netherlands in Maastricht um, next year. I'm sure it will be a, a good conference and hopefully everybody who's here in this room will uh, make the trip uh, to the Netherlands and join us. Thank you.